So our uh, next speaker, I'd like to welcome Angelika Schnecke from the Technical University of Munich, and she'll be uh, talking about gene editing in swine. Uh, hi. Um, thanks again for in, uh, inviting me to this conference and to give also a chance to talk about another species. We're now going to the slightly bigger species. You can see here our pigs. Yeah, and I don't want to infer that they are looking down at the rodents. <laughs> now this is just by chance. <laughs> um, and you will see when we talk about timelines, eight weeks, I can only laugh about that. <laughs> So the next problem you will have, of course, is uh, you will get another history. Yeah? So you're, you're hearing the history of genetic modification today, unfortunately, over and over again. Um, but I try to be quick about it. And the history for the large animal transgenics is also a little bit shorter. When Peter started, he talked about 45 years. I only have to talk about roughly 30 years. And it is a little bit more towards the large animals. Then I will talk about the genetically modified pig for biomedical research. Does it at all make sense to go for pigs when we have so many mouse models? And then why genome editing could have advantages. And you have already seen the dogs. But the dogs are just a very nice uh, way to show that genetically modifying animals we have done for such a long time. The last 12,000 years when we started to domesticate animals, we have done genetic modification. We have looked for um, mutations, natural mutations, which were advantageous, and we have bred for those. And you can see with the dogs, which goes here, you can see it always very nicely. We have small dogs, we have big dogs, dogs which fit into our handbag so um, that it might be easy to take them with us. We have made unnatural um, chimeras by breeding the mule together with uh, the donkey, uh, the mule with the horse, no, the donkey with the horse to get the mule, uh, got there in the end. Um, so we have been interfering with nature for quite a long time. And if you look at the plants, we have done it also very crudely. We have just irradiated um, the uh, seeds and then just looked what happens. So now we're coming to an age where we can actually do it sort of slightly more precise. When we talked about it, we started with the DNA microinjection. This was in 1980. In 1983, Brinster did something which was called the mouse, which was a bit larger. You can see it here than the normal mouse because it had an additional growth hormone gene. And at that time, then he also said, so that would be, of course, something if you can make mice bigger, maybe we can also make the food animals bigger. And a few years later, 1985, so this was really the start when large animal work started, a bigger pig was made. Now, so this also expressed the growth hormone gene. It was not a good target. The animal wasn't very healthy, but it did start off the large animal transgenics. So what came next? Next came the idea that if you can make transgenic large animals, the milk produces a lot of protein. So why don't we put particular genes into the mammary gland of milk animals like the cow, the sheep, and also the goat, and produce pharmaceutical proteins in the large animals? And the method, the principle is very easy. All you need is the human gene. You need a promoter which drives the expression towards the milk. You make a recombinant DNA construct, inject it, and we have seen several times now the DNA microinjection, and we make our transgenic animals, and we get the pharmaceutical proteins in the milk. And just to give you one example, you can make relatively complicated proteins. This, for example, is fibrinogen, and fibrinogen has three different chains to make one protein. That means you need to have three different genes in one animal. And with a microinjection, this is also possible. You can take all three genes, inject them together, they integrate together, and you will get animals which express such complicated proteins. And you can also show here that it's functional, but we're not talking about uh, milk production, recombinant production. We want to talk about CRISPRs. So I won't go into detail. But the big disadvantage is that the microinjection was inefficient. Peter talked about 5% of animals express your transgenes. When you come to the large animals, it gets a lot worse. 
And the reason for that is that not all embryos, as we just heard, look the same. Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so if you look here, you have a sheep, embry a sheep embryo. You have again the zona pellucida, these outer proteins, but the embryo is not as clear as you have it in the mouse. And that makes it more difficult to microinject. And if you then go to the pig, the embryo is almost black. That means you can't see the nucleus at all. So if you want to do microinjection here, if you have a well-trained microinjector, they can cope with it. In the pig, you actually have to first centrifuge the egg so that all those pigments go into one half of the embryo, and hopefully in the other half you have your pronucleus where you can inject your DNA into. That means if you work with pigs, your efficiency goes, in most cases, below 1%. And it's still true that you have to have at least five animals born before you have one which really expresses your transgene very well. And so you can see, this is one out of 20. If you need five animals, you have to have about 100 animals born before you find one which is a good expression. So that means the animals which you have here, they're not used for anything. You might use some of the females for breeding, but a lot of the animals, because they come out of a transgenic study, you can't use for anything. You can't even lose, use them for dog food. So we needed something which is somewhat more efficient. So there were transposon vectors, viral vectors, which also get your DNA into your um, uh, oocytes, but they often have size limitations or also safety problems. Um, we have heard that by just injecting, we don't know where our transgenes uh, integrate. We don't know what the sex of the founder animal is. If I want to produce transgenic animals for milk production, I might want the female. If I want to breed fast, I want, might want to have the males. And of course, it was just not possible to decide what gene in the genome we can modify. And if you want to work for biomedicine, you want to make animal models, you want to do something precise. You want to go into the genome and just change the base to replicate the human disease. So find your uh, chromosome, find the base on the chromosome, and alter it. So what do we want? 100% transgenic animals. We don't want the analysis, if possible, before we make the animals. We want to decide on the text, uh, uh, sex. We want to decide where our transgenes integrate if we want to do that. But most of all, we wanted to have a technology where we could really change single base pairs. And first of all, that was in cell-mediated transgenesis. That means in mouse, we have the embryonic stem cells. We can carry out the homologous recombination, which we heard, heard about. And then we can make the mice, but these mice are chimeras. And then came those eight weeks of breeding, which I can only smile about. <laughs> but if you have to do that in the pig, it, each time it would be over a year. So making chimeric pigs, and if you would then go to cows, yes, you can spend your lifetime breeding your animals before you have your germline um, transmission. And besides, we have heard several times, functionally as cells we have in the mouse, we have some in parts now also in the um, rat, some embryonic germ cells in the chicken, but we don't really have very well functional IPS, induced pluripotent stem cells, or ES cells yet in the pigs. Well, or for that case, in any of the large animal species. So the alternative then was, what can we do? How can we make out of a cell a whole animal again? And one possibility is using nuclear transfer. So what you can do here now is you can take cells from a fetus or from a no animal. We can even just go to the slaughterhouse and take a piece of bone. And out of the bone, isolate the bone marrow stem cells, culture these, genetically manipulate those cells, and then use them for nuclear transfer. The oocytes we use for the nuclear transfer, again, comes from slaughterhouse, just a byproduct. If you look in Germany, I'm living in the state of Bavaria, known for its sausages, and we kill about 5 million pigs a year for sausages. And not only for sausages. In Germany <laughs> alone, it is about 50 million, and in the US, the number is slightly higher than that, and worldwide, it's billions of pigs which get killed. So you can have a lot of oocytes if it comes to that. So we have the oversight, we have um, our uh, genetically modified cells, we bring the two together, 
We did the nuclear transfer, activate the genome, do the transfer of the embryos into our pseudo -pre uh, pregnant female animals. Then we can go on holiday in the sheep for 150 days. If you work with the pigs, it's three months, three weeks, three days. <clears throat> and then you might have your result, you might have your offspring. So by doing this compared to the DNA microinjections, we were actually really able to work on our three R's. We could refine because we could make our genetic modifications in the cells and could predict what the outcome would be here at the end. So the cell which is manipulated and the animal at the end has to be identical. We don't have to worry about germline transmission. We could use now material which came after animals were killed. So we could reduce our, um, the number of animals we have. We could replace the uh, oocyte source with, uh, by uh, using material from the slaughterhouse. And in total, we had a reduction, even though nuclear transfer has some problems, uh, in the number of animals we can use. So we had the first cloned animals. This was Dolly the sheep, which was done at the Roslin Institute, which I was lucky uh, that it could be my PhD project. We then made the first transgenic animals. We did the first targeted animals. So in, in, then in 2000, also the first pigs were done by somatic cell nuclear transfer. So now we could also do things in the pigs. So why do we want to work with a pig? We have heard a lot about other animal models, about the zebrafish. We can do a lot of things in cell culture. With mouse is an ideal model for do proof of principle studies. But if it comes to have the finding and especially medications and drugs which have been tested in the mouse to go into the clinic, we still have a lot of failure. Yeah, it's at the moment we have about one in 5,000 which only actually makes it in, so the, in the end in the clinic. So I don't want to say that the pig is the ideal model, but it might be an alternative model. It might be a model which might help us to do a lot more preclinical testing, validation from new uh, medication, from new drugs, for safety studies, also to uh, test out new equipment. And the physiology is much, much closer to humans than it is in the small animals in the rodents. In our lab, we're working with cancer models. Um, cancer is one of those diseases which is on the increase, partly because of uh, obesity, where it increases um, the cancer rate, but also because the population is getting older, and the older we get, this, the higher the cancer risk is. So that's one reason why we want to work with cancer. The other is also that um, there's very, very few real cures once you have cancer. And one of the important things is that you have an early diagnosis. So we want to have animal models where you can actually follow a disease and then also find biomarkers, use new imaging equipment to go for the early diagnosis. So we already have the uh, small animal models, but um, some of those small animal models really don't imitate or um, yeah, uh, replicate the human disease phenotype. How it is in the pigs, when we started, we had no idea. All we could say is that it's similar in the size to the humans. We can use human equipment, which is a great advantage. The lifespan is longer. That means we can do more experiment in a single animal. Um, but of course, it also takes time. So we can do longitudinal studies, but we have to wait a long time. Pharmacokinetics in the pig is much closer. The immune system has uh, higher similarities. And of course, if it comes to obesity, first example I also will show you is colon cancer. Um, for models of uh, diabetes, the pig you can feed uh, a human diet, also for cardiovascular diseases. That means you can feed them a cafeteria diet and they react just the same way as humans. The mouse doesn't do this. So the big question then was, what is the disease phenotype? The first model we worked on was on colorectal cancer. So this is one of the most common um, uh, cancers. And you can see up here, these are the most common mutations. The top level shows you mutations which happen naturally um, or during your lifetimes. And the bottom one are the mutations which can be germline mutations, which are an inherited uh, predisposition for colon cancer. And we have taken exactly those two inherited mutations and re um, replicated those mutations in the pig. 
So the gene is known which causes um, cancer, uh, colon cancer, which is called adenomatosis polyposis coli, shortly APC, and we put in exactly the human mutation. So if you put this mutation into the mouse, the mouse will get um, polyps, but the polyps will be in the small intestine. Humans have it in the large intestine. Because it's in the small intestines, they hardly ever get uh, to become um, carcinogenic, so they don't become real tumors, and they also don't metastasize. So when we made our PIC model, we can then use endoscopy. Unfortunately, the picture here is a little bit dark now, and we can see that these animals develop polyps. <laughs> and the polyps are in the large intestine. So this animal model replicates exactly what we see in humans. And there are a number of other animal models, um, the diabetic models, muscular dystrophy, where the pig is a lot closer in the disease phenotype to the mice. So what I showed you right now, all we did over homologous recombination in somatic cells put in a stop mutation. For other cancer models, we want to be more specific. We want to um, show that we can induce the cancer in a specific organ at a particular time. So we have made now inducible mutations also in the pig, where you have a mutant. This is here the P53 gene we heard about. This is so if, uh, one of the genes which is mutated in almost all cancers, we put a single point mutation into the fifth exon of this gene, which is also a mutation which happens quite, quite often in humans when you have a tumor. And before that, we put in a lock stop lock cassette, which stopped this mutant allele to be expressed. What we then can do is make another animal which expresses Cre recombinase. It cuts out in a particular organ, which we can predefine by what drives this Cre recombinase, this lock stop lock cassette, and then we can express the mutant. So even by normal homologous recombination, we can already do quite a lot in the pig. We have done this for P53. We're working on um, pancreatic cancer, so we have also done it for the Keras gene. And pancreatic cancer, as you might know, is one of the most lethal cancers. So this all works quite well, and we can make the animals, we can make point mutations, we can do a lot just with the homologous, um, uh, with the gene targeting. And here you can see a number of pig models which have now been developed. Um, we have models in cancer, we have in cardiovascular diseases, we have them for diabetes, cystic fibrosis, degenerative muscular dystrophy, um, and um, yeah, immune deficiency, and also several neurodegenerative diseases. So why do we want genome editing? We can do most things already with the technologies which we have, but the problem really is that gene targeting, when it comes to it, it is very inefficient. We have heard that for the mouse and for the mouse ear cells. We don't have ear cells. We have to do it in somatic cells. And if you work in somatic cells, you're another hundredfold below what you have in the mouse ear cells. So it is quite inefficient. The cell culture is hard work. And you can see here on the side, we have a number of gene targets which have really been targeted. Very few of them have been targeted. And um, I think maybe the two um, conditional gene targeting, those which you can induce specifically, but the endogenous genes have been altered. So there's very, very few examples. The two which I named just now and a couple of others. And it's very difficult to make sort of very complex mutations where you have here your uh, lock stop lock cassette and then further down you have your, um, um, your mutation. And what you can also see here is that we, when, of course, only can target one allele, we can't do both at the same time. We might also want to flux two exons. So this is, again, block sites, which you can then recombine out, and then pretty much in one particular tel cell type, delete a particular a fragment. So when we do now the genome editing, it is more efficient. It's very efficient. Even in cell culture, it does 40%. We already heard that you can edit both alleles. We can do multiple targets simultaneously, and we can then do it in the cell and in the embryo. And here you can have, again, the pig embryo. And because you only have to inject it into the cytoplasm, it doesn't matter if you see now the nucleus or if you don't see it. 
And if it comes to complicated manipulation where we want to have a point mutation, all we can do now is add the point mutation. We don't even need the selection cassette anymore. If we want to add two different lock sites to maybe take out a large fragment of the DNA, we can do this too. We can cut it to different places and then with small oligos introduce those lock sites. So what else can we do? We can do the genome editing I already mentioned in the um, embryos, but we can also do it in the cells. And in some ways the cells might also have an advantage because we can analyze exactly, do we have the right mutations? Do we have it on both alleles? And especially if we do more complicated modifications, then we carry out the nuclear transfer. And because if you know what the cell had, the animal has to have exactly the same. So that means this piglet is already analyzed principally. If we do the gene editing directly in the embryo, we save the two months of cell culture, but then we have to analyze the pig. We then have to see, do we have the right modification? And also we might have to look for um, uh, mosaicism. And if you do it in the pig, of course the breeding afterwards is not quite as easy and fast as if you do it in the mouse. So what can you do with this? This here is an example. We're working also on a project in xenotransplantation. This means you take pig organs and want to implant them into humans. Humans would reject them immediately, so we need a lot of modifications to get the organ resistant against um, the lysis from the human complements. So one of the problems was that we had already made pigs which have multiple different transgenes, all to try to prevent uh, this organ rejection. Our aim was to put all these transgenes together into one single locus, which we did. We made relatively complicated and uh, large constructs. We got these constructs into cells. You can't see it here very well. They all landed on one single location. And then we looked at a lot of different cell clones to find those which had all five genes in this case expressed and also expressed them very highly. And that meant that when we analyzed those cells, when we challenged them with human blood, these cells here, these are wild type cells, and these cells didn't lice anymore. Then the next problem you often have, you also have epitopes which gets recognized um, by the human immune system, by the complement system, which could also cause problem. Two of the well-known one is for the alpha gal no, uh, um, Look, um, epitopes and the other ones are caused by the CMRH gene, which is a different type of sugar on the cells. So what we could then do took exactly those cells which we had pre-manipulated, pre-selected. We went in with the CRISPRs and knocked out then both of those trans, uh, both of those genes on both alleles. Took then those cells with all the mutant modifications and make our next animals. And we did that also in female animals from uh, uh, independently, and so that we avoid the inbreeding. And then shortly, a couple of weeks ago, we had this publication which said, here the pig now uh, smashed the genome uh, editing record. It was done with CRISPRs. It was a very, very highly publicized uh, publication. They knocked out 62 genes over several weeks. They did it in cell culture. They did it in a cell, uh, um, in a cell line, not in primary cells, not in the animal. And of course, they had 62 times the same target. So it sounds like a great experiment. It is great to show that something like this can be done, but we would have to still see if we get animals out of the experiment. So um, it can be done in other species. And just very briefly, we heard that we had a project where we tried to manipulate the rabbit. Um, I don't want to go into details, but here again, we wanted to replace rabbit genes with human genes to make polyclonal antibody for treatment of human diseases. Um, we try to produce animals by nuclear transfer. Nuclear transfer in rabbit is still very difficult. We try to isolate ICS cells from the rabbit. We had some success, but they didn't really last long in culture. Then we used, at that time, it was still the zinc finger technology, and we could show that we could knock out the immunoglobulin genes in the rabbit uh, by just injecting it into the cytoplasm, and by injecting both uh, the zinc finger plus a target vector, we could also do homologous recombination. 
And now comes sort of the last slide I just want to show. Well, not quite the last. Um, I mentioned for our cancer models, we have done now okay, KRAS mutation, P53 mutation, APC mutations. And now we just have to add CRE to show in which different organs we get our tumors. What the CRISPR-Cas9 now allows us to do is actually, if this is a colon, slightly dark, you can see the polyps here. We can actually go back now into our, the colon and go into individual polyps and actually inject or, uh, or um, electroporate into those polyps the CRISPR-Cas9. And then even pick out different polyps where we put in different additional mutations. And we can do all this in one animal. We don't even have to make a transgenic animal. And this for us is one of the great advantages. So, of course, I was just talking the whole time about making transgenic animals either for production of pharmaceutical proteins, disease resistance, uh, disease models, or regenerative medicine. But of course, you can also use the technology uh, for the animal itself to improve its health, for the environment to change traits. I think we will have talks about that later. So here are only some of the recent publications in pigs, the micropig, which would be a pet. You might discuss um, how much sense this still makes. Here you have the double muscle pigs. Um, this is also something which in some species might make sense. In other species, it might cause um, some problems when the animals have to give birth. And then, of course, here you have the first animal which comes from the Roslin Institute. The aim of this animal was to make it more disease resistant against African swine fever. And if you can do something like this with the technology, I think it would really be a positive sign that we can improve the health of the animals. So I'm working at a technical university, and I hope with all the talks you're hearing today is now that, yes, we can do precision engineering, and we can do precision engineering now on a molecular level in the genome. Out of 3 times 10 to the 3, 3.3 times 10 to the 9 base pairs, we can pick out a single base pair and change it. We have the genome, of course. It has to be sequenced before we can decide on which base pairs. And we have now also the possibility to afterwards sequence again to show that besides those mutations, not much else has happened. Um, I don't think any PR buddy has talked about that besides knocking out genes or altering genes, we can also turn genes on. We can mark genes. We can look for expression when they get switched on and off. So there's more to the CRISPR-Cas9 technology than just the gene inactivation and new placement. So I think CRISPR-Cas9 is there to, st uh, to stay. It is the state of the art. Um, in, in Europe, we also have now a cost action which tries to sort of organize all the people who are working on the large animals so that we do not duplicate models, that we exchange technologies. We have workshops where we, for example, just taught uh, CRISPR-Cas9 technology, where we also try to set standards for the animals, also how uh, we take samples so that all the experiments should be comparable. And now the final words, we should say something about the ethics. Yes, we have the technology. We can now make um, in pretty much every species um, mutations and alterations. But that in itself, of course, is not a good enough reason that we really do it. So we have to have a risk assessment. We have to see it has to be the priority has to be still the welfare of the animals, especially if you work with large animal species. But if it has a real advantage, either for the humans or for the animal itself. I think it's a technology which we can't easily ignore. If you work with large animals, of course, you have few uh, labo uh, laboratories which can actually do it. You also, um, it's time and very cost intensive. And of course, you have the ethical concerns and so it needs to be addressed and you have to go and talk to the public. But other than that, if you look at the technologies now, animal work, is strictly regulated. Anybody who does in Germany or anywhere in Europe or in the US, you have to have an animal application before you're allowed to do it. You have to say what the benefits is. You have to see what the suffering for the animal is. So, um, and it has to be approved. So nothing different to what we could already do to the methods now with the CRISPR technology. Um, when you call, look now at the biomedicine, 
we have the large animal models, which hopefully might bring sort of benefits uh, to new products, and especially when you come to the engineering sites. You know, when you look at new imaging technologies, new methods how to um, set stents, new methods to do operation, radiation, whatever not, the mouse is not a good model for the humans. So um, we have already produced various models, and I think here the genome editing is just one more tool in our toolbox. It might reduce, it might refine, and what I showed you before that we can actually do it also in vivo, we don't have to go through the germline, might be a real advantage. When we come to agriculture, same applies. It might have good positive benefits for the animals, but on the other side, you have, of course, you know, food animals, so there's questions, can it be processed, especially in Germany, genetically modified is something which you don't want to talk about when it comes to agriculture. Does it have to be marked? Does it have to be labeled? Is it modified? Is it improved if you just change single base pairs? So with this, I would just like to say thank you. These are the people from the lab who have been involved, and if you have any questions, or we have the questions later, I don't know. Thank you.